That, that was quite a good segue into our uh, our final uh, close of speaker. Uh, for you know, our uh, John Fullerton, who is uh, president of the Capital Institute, was a former investment banker from J.P. Morgan. He uh, he spent his uh, early life in the private sector doing investment banking, and now he's uh, really working in this. He's a recognized thought leader in the uh, dialogue around uh, the new economy. So um, he's going to uh, take us through some of his, er, his experiences in the financial sector and try to incorporate some of the principles uh, that we talked about today uh, that we can uh, use in our work. And uh, anyway, uh, we're great to have you here, uh, John. Anyway, take it away. Thank you. Oh, by the way, I, before, before I say that, we, even though we have some, uh, some uh, uh, w waning of population, we still have 70 or so live people on the, stream, in, on the live streaming. So we're still, we're still quite a sizable group. But in, in a sense, as, uh, who is the uh, OD consultant says, if, whoever shows up, uh, uh, you know, it should be here, right? Uh, okay. The right people are here. Okay. Um, it's, um, it's a daunting task to, um, to try to close off this great day. Um, and you're all probably wondering, why the hell did they bring a banker in here to talk about this? Um, so just to sort of get it out on the table right at the beginning, I left Wall Street in 2001, um, so long before all the chaos. And actually, the truth is, I worked for J.P. Morgan, which was a firm that had a great culture. Uh, that culture pretty much dissipated with the big merger with Chase. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm from a different era. I, I don't look as old as that, but I, I have a, um, a, a very fond recollection of the banking business in a different time. Um, and, uh, and really that experience and what's happened since then is, has triggered uh, my current work. Um, this, let's see if that works. Does that work? Red? Push red or, or white? Yeah. Try a new clicker. Um, so uh, real briefly, my story is that, I, as I said, I left in 2001. Thank you. Um, and um, soon after I left, I walked into 9-11 uh, in person, sort of experienced that up front. And uh, I'd already decided, in, in, in fact, Otto's talk this morning, by the way, what a master teacher. Um, I, I'm just amazed and, um, and, and, of course, frightened as a result of that. <laughs> um, but um, uh, I left in, in 2001 really from what Otto's uh, described as this heart-driven decision. Um, uh, and this was before all the craziness, so it wasn't out of some moral, I can't take it working here anymore. It was just a feeling. And uh, because of the merger, you know, the truth is my stock options had vested, so I had some financial cushion, and I, I just decided to leave uh, with no plan. And then the next time I was downtown, literally the first day I was downtown was 9-11, and I got out of the subway right as the second plane hit, um, and that obviously uh, affected me very deeply. And I, I went into kind of a, a period of deep think and introspection, kind of my six-month sabbatical, uh, and I started reading books, and I read Limits to Growth, and that was just for a finance person who understands that the whole system is designed around exponential growth, and to begin to question that that may not actually be physically possible, just rocked my world. Um, and I read Herman Daly, and I read um, E.F. Schumacher, and on and on and on, and kind of went into what's essentially, I guess, an existential crisis about uh, everything I believed was true was fundamentally flawed, not at an ideological level, but at a physical level. Uh, it wasn't any longer possible to, to continue. And I started talking about this with my banker friends, and they thought I lost my marbles, and, and um, you can imagine how that went. And really it was only um, uh, when the financial crisis happened that I had the courage to, to launch what's now called Capital Institute, which is a very modest think tank. Uh, I wish it had the funding of, of uh, USAID, but um, uh, it doesn't. And, um, and really to create a place to explore these, this really existential crisis in economics and finance. 
Um, and uh, it takes a poet to articulate um, uh, what I actually believe is true. Our financial, our economic system has become a financial system. Uh, you know, the, the Federal Reserve just recently decided not to raise interest rates, mostly because the financial markets are in distress. So we've, we've got it, um, we're really quite lost. And, uh, and, and so rather than sort of join the, the, the talking heads screaming about whether we need more or less regulation or more or less this and the other thing, I went into a study of systems, um, I guess triggered probably by reading Limits to Growth, and discovered the whole biomimicry, living systems worlds, and, um, and got very intrigued with that. In fact, some of my own investment products, uh, projects were uh, anchored around that. And um, I'm not, I'm not going to, I had some slides, I didn't have time to fix the slides, so I'll go through this quickly. But obviously, um, you know, you're all very familiar with the accelerating and cascading crises. This chart sort of summarizes that economic growth doesn't work. The, the, the chart going up, or the line going up in brown is, is GDP growth per capita, and the blue line is, is um, genuine progress. Uh, those stopped moving together right about the time I joined Wall Street. Um, and uh, that's probably uh, my experience, is, is the di divergence of those. We're all familiar with ecological overshoot. I've done a lot of work on the idea that if there is, if we are in ecological overshoot, I would posit we're also in financial overshoot because the entire financial system is predicated on exponential growth of material throughput, and it's also priced on that assumption. So if, if that's no longer true, uh, there, you know, I could get us all depressed at the end of the day, which I won't, but, it, but it, there is a reckoning to, um, to come, and I actually believe it's already started. Uh, we just don't describe it in, in these words. But there is a, a reckoning to come uh, between how financial assets are valued and the physical realities of, of an economic system. Um, this all came to light when I learned about this thing called the Anthropocene. How many people know what the Anthropocene is? Um, it's, it's actually a, we are now in a new geologic era, uh, Anthropocene meaning the period in which will be controlled by man. Anthropocene, um, back actually in 2002, and the economists picked this up in 2011, uh, and most people still don't know anything about it. But the thought that the future of our planet literally is in the hands of mankind's decisions is fundamentally new and different and, um, and changes everything. Um, and it certainly changes economics and finance. And I'll remind everyone, one of the things that Otto said this morning was that the economic system is the big issue. And so um, I've been in search of a better, uh, more true uh, approach to economics and finance and you can imagine that's a bit of a lonely journey. Uh, and that has, what has been what brought me into this whole question of theory. Um, could I ask someone for, oh, here we go. I'm just gonna, this is my Marco Rubio moment. Um, by the way, did, did you all see Marco Rubio? I mean, talk about the antithesis of, of what Otto told us. Um, with his response about climate change, um, at least they're no longer denying that climate change is real, but um, for the largest emitter in the world per capita to declare that we're not going to do anything that might in fact impact our short-term jobs and whatnot is pretty stunning by one of our leading candidates, but that's a digression. Um, but I've gotten very interested in this question of theory. Um, and the reason is, is that, and Einstein said this brilliantly when someone told me about this, I said, that's exactly right. Um, we're trapped in a flawed theory. We're, it's like we have a map of Paris, but we're in Hong Kong. And so everything we do, we, we relate back to a map that's a flawed map. And I suspect, I see some nodding heads, I suspect, you know, your work um, is, is in ways you don't even realize uh, being driven by a belief system about economic theory and economic growth that no one has bothered to question. Now, obviously, we need economic growth in the world, in the markets that you guys operate in. Um, but that, that is, um, Jane Jacobs and Sally, um, and I'll get to Sally in, in a second, but 
Jane Jacobs uh, famously said, it's not how, how big you grow, it's how you grow big, which ties us into this um, uh, systems approach to, to understanding how, how to develop sustainable systems. Um, but I've become very interested in theory. Um, and, and here's sort of my simple summary of the theory around which we in finance view the world. There's this thing called the planet, and that's where we get our natural resources, both raw materials and human beings who are labor in the context of our economic framework. Uh, those are all inputs to the economy. And we masters of the universe in finance sit above it all and optimize the capital allocation decisions. And if we do that if, well, it's this wonderful thing. Everything works out great. Um, and, and by the way, as I was listening to the discussion about the donors and the contracts and the recipients, and, and uh, it reminded me a lot of, you know, the role of the capitalist, the venture capitalist in that world is essentially the donor. And, uh, you know, the old expression, he with the gold, uh, he who has the gold makes the rules or whatever. Um, uh, and, and the truth is, in the venture capital world, the great, great successes are driven by the entrepreneurs who intuit the change that's happening in the real world, and the venture capitalists are largely along for the ride. Now, the venture capitalists won't um, acknowledge that, but uh, my reaction to listening to that conversation was that um, uh, the, the, um, the, the balance of power, if you will, maybe in your, in your world, it's still, um, still a little bit like the venture capital industry used to be or wants to be, as opposed to how things work really well. But anyway, getting back to this picture, um, obviously there's something wrong with this picture, and, um, and this is actually the way we need to understand the system working, which is that we have a financial system in service of a real economy, which understands that it's embedded in, in the biosphere or in the planet. And, um, and that change is extremely profound and nothing to do with the other problem we have, which is that we've become, we've, we've turned the economy into a, in a, into a speculative financial system. And that obviously broke down horribly badly several years ago. Um, but all of the energy around finan financial reform has been to try to rein in the speculative excess and no one, in, you know, none of the serious people running the world are yet questioning the fundamental um, uh, incongruence of a, a debt-based economic system that's dependent on exponential growth forever. And by the way, it's not just money and debt, it's also equities. All, the whole stock market is valued based on long-term growth assumptions. Um, so we're only at the very beginning of rethinking all this stuff. And that's, um, that's where my work and passion comes in. Um, I put out a paper uh, earlier this year called Regenerative Capitalism. Uh, some people got put off by the word capitalism. Uh, and by the way, it's important to say how universal principles and patterns will shape our new economy. Um, I'd been working on this for a couple years and along the way uh, met Sally. And um, I, had, I had this mostly from the living systems perspective and, and, and learning out of that universe. And what Sally added, and Sally, I'm happy to, to now be able to call a colleague, she brought sort of the hard science dimension into this, and, and it, it all crystallized. And the, the basic premise is that um, if, we're, if we're lost, we don't have a map and we're lost, and we're trying to find our way, why not look to sustainable systems that exist in the universe and see if there are some universal patterns and principles that you could describe them with? And if there are, then the hypothesis is, if we want a sustainable economic system, then we assume or assert that the human economic system is yet one more um, uh, system in the universe that we want to be sustainable. And either those universal principles apply to it, or we have to make the case as to why the human economy doesn't have to obey the universal principles and patterns. And I've made the assumption that the economy does need to follow those patterns, and, um, and I've tried to discern what they are. Uh, and, and the first step in that, the first step in that process is the shift we've been talking about all day, which is the shift from a, um, an industrial mind or a mechanistic mind to an ecological mind. And it's fascinating that, you know, this conference was inspired around an understanding of that idea, even though I've not studied international development at all. Um, and it's happening in healthcare, you know, holistic medicine. 
Um, it's happening in, in the business world. The difference between the Business Alliance for Local Living Economies, which is primarily a domestic initiative, but I think uh, with great parallels to some of the work you're doing, it's, a, it's the idea of uh, emergent economy, place-based economies that are, that are um, thriving based on, as someone said earlier, not scaling up one model, but scaling up an idea of place-based economies and a network of them around the country. Um, there's even a big com company, uh, DNV is a Norwegian multi-billion multi dollar multinational, um, but they are embracing these regenerative ideas. I've been to three roundtables there over three years. Um, interestingly, it's, a, it's actually a private company, it's not a public company, so that allows them to do things that public companies can't do. Um, but this is emergent in, even in big multinational companies. And then obviously, you know, modern finance, I think, is the probably extreme example of reductionist thinking. Uh, you know, I actually started out as a derivative expert um, before that became a, a dirty word. And, um, and derivatives were very proud to segregate risks into component parts and then manage them separately. And then, lo and behold, all the geniuses are surprised that all those different parts are still connected and we have the mortgage crisis that turns into you know, essentially a crisis of the global economy and bankrupting Greece and everything else. Um, so there's nothing more reductionist than finance. And this guy um, was our hero through the 80s and 90s um, by this whole idea of shareholder value and optimizing shareholder value and managing quarterly earnings to get the stock price higher. And of course, when the whole thing blew up in smoke, he came out and said, shareholder value is the dumbest idea in the world. So we have, a, um, we have as a culture an ability to pick the wrong heroes and, and, and follow the wrong leaders. This guy, um, I don't know if, if he's a name that's familiar with you, but he was literally a, a management guru back in the 60s and 70s. He brought um, what was, you know, and I was actually asked to go give a talk at the Deming Institute, and I said, well, what does my work have to do with Deming? And they said, well, he was a systems thinker. And I said, no, he was like that quality circle guy in Japan. Well, I start reading his stuff. It's all systems. It's amazing. He had all this figured out. If our business schools would just simply give out his textbooks, we would be in such better shape than we are right now, I can't be begin to tell you. Um, so try to relate this to, to your work, and, and Paul and I had a, had a conversation before. Um, I understand that the paradigm has sort of gone from aid-driven to market-based solutions, and there's a lot of successful capitalists that are in your business now who think that all we need to do is spread the capitalist system that made me so successful to the people in the world that it hasn't reached and everything will be fine. Um, that to me sounds a little bit like Jack Welch and it sounds kind of reductionist. Um, so it's fascinating to me that, again, not because Sally came here or I came here, but because on your own, you guys are just intuiting that you're, you're in search for a different roadmap um, and, and you've found the same roadmap. I mean, I read Otto's work several years ago and felt like he was writing a book about my personal journey down the U and back up the other side. Um, and so it's, it's all ha it's happening. You know, there's no question. I have no doubt in my mind that this is happening. You, you know, people have talked today about how complex this is. And one of my, one of my um, teachers, Alan Savory, who I'll get to in a minute, uh, likes to say that there's a huge difference between um, managing and understanding what's complicated and managing complexity. And we as human beings really don't know how to manage complexity yet. And we, we need to understand that. Um, and therefore failure will be everywhere. Um, and it already is everywhere. Um, um, this is a, um, uh, so an, another, another doorway for me into this regenerative thinking was through a, a, sep a separate investment project, in this case in the real estate world. And uh, there is a field of regenerative real estate development where the project essentially ends up being net positive for the community that it exists in, the ecology that it exists in, and the, uh, the developers and, and the financial people involved in it. And uh, they have a chart that looks quite similar to this, which again is one of these sort of lightning bolt uh, insights for me. I, in the business world, we've been all talking about sustainability and how do we get from the left to sustainable. But the truth is, just like in our bodies, the reason that we're all living and breathing is that our bodies are continuously regenerating. You know, we re replace ourselves every seven years. So, so a sustainable body is an outcome of a process that's continuously regenerating. 
And Otto this morning talked about um, uh, uh, generative uh, at, at the level of consciousness. Well, I actually believe that our entire economic system can be regenerative if we tap into this fourth layer. So it's the connection of economic design and this consciousness move to me is, is very clear. And probably we won't figure out how to do this at the economic level without tapping into that, um, uh, that consciousness shift. Um, but, the, but the idea here is that by tapping into natural system design, living system design, these universal principles, we will be able to identify how to organize an economy, both at the local level and regional level, but ultimately, uh, if we believe in these principles, one of the principles is this idea of fractal designs. Things, the pattern repeats at local small scale as it does at big scale. There will be some principles that we can apply to all situations. And I think that's the, that's the search of the new, of the new roadmap that, we, um, that we're, we're involved in. And the paper I wrote and, and delivered at Yale earlier this year, um, uh, which was, um, uh, had a lot of, of input and help from Sally, um, but interestingly, a lot of it was there even before Sally. So it was Sally's arrival in my world kind of validated roughly where I was heading, and it crystallized it and made it better. These are the eight principles I came up with, and, and, and it doesn't mean those are right. There's, there's, there's a couple of important things to say about any kind of holistic approach, one is you can't reduce it to principles because it's the pattern that matters, but because we're trying to communicate with each other and we use the English language, or I use the English language to do that, in many ways this would probably be better to do in Chinese because it's a pattern uh, system, not a linear system, uh, but my Chinese is not up to that. Um, uh, so these are the ones I came up with, and, and we don't, I don't want to belabor and dive into them terribly deeply. I think Many of them will be um, recognizable and self-evident, but I do want to drill down just a little bit. Um, we, you know, in right relationship, um, everything in living systems is about relationships between parts, not about the parts. Um, and going back to finance, the whole approach to um, uh, the, the dominance of capital markets and securitizing mortgages and all that is all about breaking um, uh, the relationship between investor and enterprise and the relationship between lender and borrower. So we've, we've massively shifted away from in-right relationship in finance and wonder why we see the consequences we have. Uh, holistic wealth, I don't need to drill into that, but there's a lot of work being done in finance about multiple capitals, not just financial capital. So my regenerative capitalism is uh, presumes an understanding that we need to think about wealth in a holistic way, not purely as money. Um, we've talked a lot about innovation and, and adaptation. Uh, empowered participation, one is I think that's totally relevant to you. I don't know if you can see that. There's a bunch of countries um, scattered on this chart. Uh, what's important is that income inequality is, goes up to the right. So further to the right is more inequality. And on the uh, y-axis is a, an index of health and social problems, one of which would include um, suicide and other mental health as well as physical health issues. And what this shows is that there's a clear correlation between countries. This isn't the inequality between Kenya and the United States. This is inequality within Kenya and within the United States. Um, and what it shows is that countries that have high levels of inequality uh, show up worse in these, in these health and well-being indicators. And I think, you know, we can probably recognize and experience that. And guess what? The United States is that country way up in the upper right. So um, the work of tackling inequality is no longer just a moral thing that some people care about and some people don't. It's actually a systemic requirement. Just like if I want to go for a run tonight, but my body isn't circulating blood and oxygen to my feet, I'm not going to be able to run. So my system is dependent on blood circulating to my feet just as and, and my feet in being empowered to participate in my ability to run, just as the work you're doing in the countries you're working in, literally, if one believes the hypothesis, is an important contr contributor to the health of the whole system. Um, uh, someone mentioned in one of the panels this idea of what if, what if piloting and then scaling is a bad idea because the context is unique every place we go. That really resonates with me. 
This, I, you know, one of the principles that I came up with is, is we need to honor community in place. Another way of saying that is every context is unique. And so scaling up may be an industrial idea that doesn't necessarily apply, or it certainly doesn't apply as much as we assume it does. Um, edge effect, you know, there's lots of discussion which I would, I would be able to summarize into uh, working around the edges, different sectors, um, bringing people, you know, different stakeholders together. This is really hard work, but this is where the regenerative potential often lies, just as it is in living systems. Uh, in living systems, the edge of where a river meets the ocean, an estuary, is where lots of life happens. It's where danger happens. It's hard, um, but that's where the creative potential lies. Um, Sally's work uh, touched tremendously on the uh, circulatory flow uh, and this idea of balance, and so I won't repeat it. I just want to reiterate the importance of this chart. Um, I found this chart before I found Sally, but when I saw it, I used to go around and I had a slide before it in, in talks where I would introduce this chart as the most important chart in the world. And as a finance person uh, and, and, and working in the world of economics, you know, everything is about optimizing efficiency. And so the thought that efficiency wasn't the right goal was, was, it was heretical. But, but here it shows very clearly that, you know, to me, the global economy, whether it's globalization and securitization and derivatives and all that stuff, has moved us systematically throughout my, my career, and I had something to do with this, I have to take responsibility, sort of moving us over to the right to become extremely efficient but also brittle. And, um, and, and what we need is a little bit less efficiency and more resiliency in the system overall. But if we had that as our roadmap, the conversations about, for example, should we have a tax on speculation would, would change. But we're operating in the old paradigm, which is that efficiency is everything. So when you raise the idea of taxing speculation to make markets more resilient, you get thrown out of the room because, oh, that's bad for efficiency. Um, so we really need this new roadmap, and um, of course my, my uh, contribution to the arts is, is not quite what Otto's was, but it's interesting again, uh, another example, so, so I would argue that, that the symphony we saw was holistic, um, uh, an expression of the holistic and, and regenerative potential that exists in the world of, of, in that case, music. The same thing applies in the world of art, and imagine the parts here and this gets to the point about the relationships. The parts here are brush strokes. Um, brush strokes on their own don't compose a Monet painting. It's the relationship of the brush strokes all together that create this regenerative potential that existed in Monet's head. Uh, it's amazing. And, and so this shift from reductionist thinking and managing parts and managing uh, complexity by reducing it down to what we can understand and then trying to keep um, a, a grip on the whole is really, really hard. And we've become really good at reductionist thinking literally since the Enlightenment. And now all of a sudden, with chaos accelerating, we're forced to learn how to think a different way in a holistic way. Um, we shouldn't underestimate how hard that's going to be. And I, even though I'm now totally conscious of it, uh, when I work with people who get this, they constantly are reminding me how I'm shifting or slipping back into uh, a reductionist uh, mode. Uh, one of the things we do at Capital Institute is try to tell stories about where this is all happening in the real world, so you get out of the theory and into the real world. Um, we have a project called our Field Guide to Investing in the Regenerative Economy. There's some 30-odd stories there now that, that are um, populating it. I'm sure we could add lots of stories uh, from your work. Um, but I wanted to just uh, tell you about one of them, uh, this one that I'm personally involved in, which I think has direct relation, uh, relevance to, to your work. Has anyone heard of Alan Savory? Is that name? Does anyone know what the second largest carbon sink on planet Earth is? The grasslands. Yes. Who said yes? Well, what I was thinking is where the... Uh, yeah. Basically, the... Well, so this is complicated, and, and I know this is late, so I'm not, I'm not going to go in this in, in gory detail, but, but uh, um, I can send you plenty more information about it. But Alan Savory is a 75-year-old, roughly, um, man who lives in Zimbabwe, and uh, his passion is what he calls the bush, which is what, what in Africa we, we would call the grasslands. Um, and he watched, after years and years of studying 
the, the bush deteriorating. And, and he, he, he figured out by watching animals, so again, looking to living systems, biomimicry, uh, herds of big animals move in herds to protect themselves from predators. But the modern paradigm of ranching is to put a fence up and put the cows out and let them eat whatever they want with no predators. And in fact, when predators show up, we shoot the predators. And so the cattle, the way the modern cattle paradigm works is that cows wander around and eat what they want, and then that degrades the grass. And so then the range scientists conclude, well, the cattle must be the problem. So then in places like the United States, we then set apart areas with no cattle, and the rangeland continues to deteriorate. And it turns out that there's a symbiotic relationship between herbivore, large herds of herbivores and grass that allows the grass to be healthy. Uh, and that's because the hoof action on the ground turns over the soil, uh, the manure obviously fertilizes the soil, and by eating grass but, but keep moving because of predators, the grass actually doesn't, you know, you don't overgraze, you, you graze it down and then the sun photosynthesis happens and it, and it grows again. And like anything in life, the growth curve on grass looks like this. And so if you, if you graze it down to, say, you know, depending on where it is, a few inches, then it enters that exponential growth curve again. And because what photosynthesis means is that you're taking carbon dioxide out of the air, releasing the oxygen for us to breathe, and putting the carbon in the soil, it turns out that the soil below the grasslands are the second largest carbon sink after the oceans, bigger than the forests. And so we've been systematically releasing carbon from this massive carbon sink, which has a massive contribution to climate change, and then, by the way, since we don't have the animals to keep the grass healthy, we burn it systematically all across the world, particularly in Africa, which then further releases carbon into the atmosphere. Um, Alan figured this all out and, and learned it by studying holistic thinking. He read Jan Smuts. And if you want to learn about holism, read Jan Smuts. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a mind bender. Um, so here's a, a quick map of the grasslands. Anywhere that's, that's brown is, is grass. It's obviously a massive part of the world. Uh, it's also a massive part of the world that I think you all operate in. And, um, and here's just one photograph of a ranch uh, that's managed. This, is, this photograph is taken from a bridge on the, on, at one time, pointing one way and then the other. And the piece on the right, was, is, that's a conventional way land is managed. And on the left, it's holistically managed. And you can imagine that there's a lot more grass growing on the left. That means you can actually graze more animals per acre, which means it's more profitable for the rancher, which obviously transforms the social uh, reality and cultural reality of the rancher that practices uh, on the left versus the right. The Savory Institute has 30 hubs around the world uh, developing and training people in this practice. And um, it always strikes me how little this is known by the development community where they're operating in regions that are essentially uh, grasslands. Alan has worked with um, tribes in Kenya where they, you know, families have one or two cattle each and they move them in together and manage them as a herd in a community. Uh, there's all kinds of, of interesting potential um, there. But just to wrap it up, and I, I know I'm probably going on, um, the, the, uh, the shift that I think we're a part of and have the privilege to live during the time that it's happening. I, you know, I used to say, this can't be right. Something this big can't be happening just at the moment I happen to be alive and I happen to have been a banker and now I'm, I experienced this 9-11 and I've read all this stuff and I'm thinking, wow, we're in the middle of this like once in 500 year shift. What's the chance of that? But, you know, I've been thinking about it for a lot of years now. And I'm very confident that we're, we're part of a, a very profound shift, and that's scary. Um, but it's also exciting, and it gives us, I think, a, a sense of purpose. I think it will give, um, you know, Otto mentioned the millennials are, are all over this stuff. Well, they get this in their DNA. Um, and I've, I've experienced that with, with many of them. That, you know, when I have conversations about finance and economics with millennials, it's, yeah, yeah, now what do I do? Whereas when I have it with my friends and people older than me, they just, it's this resistance. And, no, oh, that can't be, that can, you know, you're missing. Well, technology will solve this, or there's some solution to it. So, um, you know, Galileo, um, uh, he basically proved what Copernicus had figured out 80 years before him um, by, by using his microscope. And we don't have 80 years to see this new paradigm, uh, because in 80 years, the big problems that are cascading now will 
we'll, it'll be too late. So our challenge in every, every field from medicine to uh, international economic development to finance and, and mainstream economics, we need to kind of reinvent and find a new roadmap. And, um, and I believe the answer lies in looking, you know, and again, to, to echo what Otto said, the answer is already there. It's just that we've got this false map that we've constructed and then built on top of. And so we need to kind of get back to what we already know. And I'm sure tapping into this rising consciousness is the key to doing that. I've, I've um, become more and more interested in that personally since I've been on this journey. So um, that, no, there's no question that Otto was probably the key person you could have had in the room this morning. So anyway, I'll leave it on that. Sure. I'll come down here, too. For uh, my name is Alexander Sakisov. I have a question. Uh, about a couple of years ago, I heard a lecture in Russia by Dennis Meadows, yeah. who's the author of The Limits to Growth. He published three books, da da da. Yeah. And they have this graph. Uh, for like through 2050 and beyond for a hundred years and uh, the message I heard from him is basically that we're past the stage where some change in global policies could result in some equilibrium and his idea was that now we should focus on how to alleviate the consequences rather than so you were talking about the eight years, yeah. so we have eight more years, so how do yeah. this? So great, great question. Um, uh, and, you know, the people that kind of get this fall into a range of categories from very pessimistic to overly optimistic. And it's not a, a secret within this community that Dennis is on the pessimistic end. Um, and none of us knows the answer to this. I'll, I'll tell you an interesting, so I'm involved in this work with the Club of Rome, um, which is where this work originated. And we are trying to answer a question. We actually have to deliver an answer to the following question. Is system change possible without collapse? And so we're, you know, it's a paper, but it's a group project. And uh, at the beginning of it, we asked everyone, there's probably 20 people involved in it. And we asked everyone, to put a number on a piece of paper from zero to 10, uh, 10 being I'm highly confident, I'm totally confident we can solve this, and zero being there's no chance. And, um, and it was fascinating, the, the, the range of answers in that room went from three to nine and a half. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know what the answer is, but for me personally, um, and I, we were talking about this at our table, I've chosen to believe in this regenerative potential that is there for us to tap into, even though it's not yet manifest. I know that exists. I've experienced that on a very personal level. Um, and, and I know if we just stick with the simple logic, which is what I'd argue Dennis is doing, then the answer is pretty clear that we're screwed. Um, so the, the, the key is to tap into this regenerative potential, what I call regenerative potential, call it what you want, um, and, and just as Otto said, you know, who would have guessed the Germans would, would, would lead taking in the refugees? So things are going to happen that none of us expect, including Dennis Meadows, as smart as he is. Um, so that's where I come out on that. And, and when you asked the question, it reminded me of um, uh, your comment about we, we need to make the problem clearer and smaller. So I'll throw out a counterpoint just to prove how little we really know what we're talking about. Um, uh, and I'm not saying you're wrong, I'm not saying I'm right, but um, uh, I have a great quote from Eisenhower, who was asked once, um, he was giving a talk on military strategy, which was, he apparently was, was I'm not a, a great history buff, but what, was, what made him a genius was his military strategy. Uh, and, and, and so someone asked him, you know, what do you do when you see a problem you can't solve? And he said, I make the problem bigger. Um, so I'm actually, I actually think holistic thinking often requires us to make problems bigger, not smaller, but uh, I'm sure the opposite is also true, just like a lot of these things. So. Yep. Thanks. 
Uh, thanks, John, for a wonderful talk. I use that quote a lot too in some Did? of my presentations. And, and not uh, two to, against one. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and just to follow up on the last point, though, and to, to be a little short, shameless plug, is that I have a book just recently out called Flourishing Within the Limits, and we actually developed a model based on the limits to growth um, uh, model that they use, and using ecological principles have showed that there's some scenarios that you can actually have kind of a win-win outcome. And so it's this flourishing within the limits. And we've actually have talked with some of the Club of Rome people about mm. this, and so yeah. we should follow up more yeah. about that. Yeah, good. I mean, if, if the, for those of you who are not familiar with it, you can read, there's, there's been some research done to assess the original 76 papers, and they essentially say they got it right. And we're pretty much tracking the base case scenario. Uh, and, and those who, who are familiar with limits growth will know that it was dismissed, de derided, trashed. You know, Dennis, Dennis has had a hard career, and his co-authors, um, those that are still with us, because they were just, you know, crushed. Um, and, and boy, it would have been nice to use the 40 years we've wasted, or 30, whatever it is. Um, but anyway, the, the unfortunate truth is that we're kind of tracking their base case, and we're just now getting to the critical areas and whether or not we can shift the system fast enough without, you know, particularly the climate issue is the one that um, uh, is, is the most frightening because it's, it's one that you can't undo in at least, at least within long periods of time. So, yes? Um, have you thought about, seems like there's three huge factors, I don't know what you call them even, that might not have been around when Meadows first wrote The Limits to Growth they, and his authors, which is the, the incredible growth of, the, of, of what, the, what computers can do, exponential mm -hmm. growth. And the second is the enormous connectivity that's possible through the internet yep. and it growing all the time. And the third is the um, rise of artificial intelligence, which is... It, happening extremely quickly. Yeah. When you put those three factors together, have you thought about what that might mean? Yeah, and I think one of the main critiques of limits to growth is that they underestimated technological change, so you're absolutely right. And, and that's, I'm sure, true. I mean, how, how could you not underestimate technological change? Um, so um, the way I think about, let's take the internet and, and the whole social media. So, so the internet was invented, what, 40 years ago, maybe? And it took until, I don't know, 10 years ago for us to manifest search and then manifest social media. So that to me is living proof that there's regenerative potential to be used well or poorly. I mean, I'm saying everything's perfect about Facebook and whatnot. But, um, but that's a great example of of, of how you know, we shouldn't make a judgment today about what's possible even in the next three years, much less the next 25 years. Um, artificial intelligence scares me, uh, to be honest. And one of the key things in this, in this Club of Rome project that we're working on is just the impact of technology on, on the whole concept of jobs. And you know, I think we need to reinvent what it means to make, you know, have a livelihood because you know, there's, that's, that ship has left the dock, and, and uh, it's, there's no easy, talk about no easy answers, right? Um, but, um, but yeah, I mean, that, you know, on a, on a good day, you get really optimistic, and on a bad day, you get really depressed. What, what I would say is that there's a real danger that we just kind of, one of the forms of denial that is prevalent is, oh, well, you know, we'll solve that problem. We've always solved our problems. We'll solve that problem. Which, which denies the reality that a lot of our technological advances are actually the root of many of these problems. So that's a trick. That's a trick. Yeah. I was, I was going to ask uh, what, I mean, it, uh, how much uh, you've kind of been involved in the discussions with shared, like the shared value uh, concepts that moving from like maximizing stakeholder or shareholder values to, to yeah. our, um, you know, shared value and how we, you know, companies are dependent on the health of yeah. the communities and clients they serve. It sounds a lot, yeah. what you're saying sounds a lot like the shared value concepts. Yeah, that's a, that's a piece of it for sure. Um, you know, when I first started on this, I started writing a paper I, I was going to call social capitalism. 
And then I sent around to a couple of people and I said, have you ever met Jed Emerson? And he's been working on this, what he calls blended value for 25 years. And then, you know, I, I don't want to say any not nice things, but those ideas were pretty much lifted and promoted better in the shared value. So this is not a new, new thinking. Um, but uh, I would argue that the whole stakeholder capitalism shared value is still operating out of the same paradigm. It's just, you know, it's part of this. We need to internalize externalities. We need to, you know, it's, it's incremental. It's critical. So we, I don't want to, I, I certainly am not criticizing it, but it's not a fundamental rethink. It's not looking to universal principles and then using those as our guide. It's just taking what we have and extending out from where, what, we, what we know. And, and ultimately, we need the people that are working from inside and extending out and then the people that are in sort of my camp that are thinking way outside the box, you know, the one thing I can say is that the space between that and that is shrinking fast. And, and what I would have said two years ago in an audience that's working on this, they wouldn't even know what I'm talking about. Um, you know, now I, I it's like, I, I can just tell. Yeah, yeah, we need, you know, we need it. So it's, it's all moving very fast, and so it's, it's very exciting. I don't know if that answers you. Your question. Yeah. So yes and no. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Good. I, Pretty I, much wiped out. <laughs> anyway, I uh, thank you so much for such an inspiring presentation, and. Uh, and I,